so Tom, do you want to tell us a little bit about uh, your farming system? Yeah, so we're transitioning into, or three years into transitioning into a regenerative farming system. Uh, we farm 900 hectares between what we lease, or what I own and what Dad owns. Um, we've simplified our enterprises. We were running cattle, uh, 100 sow piggery, sheep and crops. Um, for other factors, we've simplified that to sheep and cropping now. Um, we're going to a self-replacing ewe flock and uh, we transitioned to st full stubble retention, disc seeding, uh, dropping out a lot of synthetic fertilisers, insecticides, fungicides, um, and strategically using cover crops to enhance it. It's a lot of changes. How's your dad coping with that, Colin? Oh, if there, <laughs> was, if there, was, if there was some hair there, it's nearly gone. <laughs> so, do you think it's working? Um, a bit hard to quantify. Um, financially, it's making a lot of sense. Um, we've had three variable years since we've started. Um, last year got battered from pillar to post. Um, I suppose we haven't seen a, this, you know, this supposed decline or drop off, um, but it's still in its infancy, so it's yeah, a bit hard to quantify. Haven't seen a massive jump, but haven't seen anything that's, d that's d detracted from it. So you're talking about yield. What about, you know, are you seeing things changing in your soil or diversity or water capture, uh, thickening of your, your summer covers, anything going on? Um, I think in a, we've got one paddock we've set aside for five years to get continuous warm season, season covers following the cash crop. Um, I think its infiltration rate is improving the quickest. Um, with the stubble retention, we're definitely getting uh, longer, longer moisture availability. We get a rainfall, full, full ground cover. Um, we're utilising or holding onto the moisture for a little longer. Um, you have a control area that we saw on the photo. Um, for those that saw the photo, I thought it, was, it wasn't the best photo, but the summer cover is actually looking really good. Um, that was just a bad angle. I was out there the year before and the summer co cover was very sparse. There was a plant here, a plant there. Uh, did anyone go to the biological farm round table at Tom's place? Yeah, so that's very consistent now, that paddock that we went out to and I, I noticed that yesterday. Um, what are you seeing um, that's different in the control area? Funnily enough, nothing. Um, which I suppose you might like to see something, but it's it's not getting, if you want to, well, the idea was to be comparing it that if we were using or weren't using covers, how that would play out. Um, it's a tiny little area, so I'm not going to bother going and fallow spraying it. So there are tiny little weeds growing there, um, but as far as the denser cover crops, deeper root systems that in theory are using all our moisture, um, we haven't seen any, any difference at this point between the control strip and the rest of the paddock, which I suppose is a good thing. Mm. No, no change is better than, than a decline. I did see your soil test. Was there a change there? Um, everything since we've gone to the um, stubble retention um, using the disc, we've increased everything by 0.2% in our organic matter. Um, that control strip is 0.2% behind the rest of the paddock. So you've got an increase by 0.2 yep. by using all of your regenerative methods. Within that paddock, yeah, from yep. the control. Yep, okay. Um, how many chemical passes do you think that you save by having summer covers as opposed to having a summer fallow? I suppose that's a bit dependent on the year and rainfall events, but generally speaking, I suppose the sprayer would come out twice a year in a conventional system. Um, potentially more um, if you've got something there growing and where the other part of it is we also want to utilize it as stock feed um, the sprayer stays in the shed just because we're wanting it to grow mm, yeah. um, hard to say because there's no sort of set regime for s summer spray it depends on rainfall but definitely a couple of passes it saves you what's your folular application that you use in crop yeah um, we we went this year to Folia urea, um, uh, application of 10, 10 kilos per hectare of five units of nitrogen. Um, 
we also used over the period of the year five litres of Nutrisoil um, that was split between a couple of uh, selective herbicide sprays and the foliar spray um, and with the foliar nitrogen we saw the plants were all sufficient after five units and that was late tillering. Um, might keep you in there for a bit of a sleep of night factor to keep things moving along in these early stages but um, yeah very efficient. You did some work with Sarah Fay, who is an agronomist uh, from Toowoomba. She's very regenerative in, in her advice. What work did you do with her? Um, coming up to, we had planned on doing two um, nitrogen applications. Um, coming, or after we did the leaf tissue test after the first application, everything came up sufficient of nitrogen. Um, I think it was boron and sulfur was coming up deficient. We had rain, and then all the root depth change. So all, that's now going to be in a different pool of nutrients. We weren't sure what to do. We we're humming and hurrying. The plants were sufficient for nitrogen. What would we do? Um, spoke to Sarah and she suggested setting up what we had on hand. So we had, still had a bit of urea on hand, had some Nutrisoil. Um, her suggestion was to have a control spot and then do variable rates, variable combinations of nitrogen at two different rates nitrogen at different rates with different rates of Nutrisoil and just Nutrisoil to see what would give our biggest bang for a buck using um, a BRICS reading to see what the plants responded the most to. Um, so we did that, uh, came back in an hour and the nitrates had jumped the BRICS by about 6% or something and the biologicals had done nothing which stumped me. I thought that's not making any sense to me. Um, we came back 24 hours later and the, nit or the nitrogen spots had come back to the control and balanced and the biological had come up 4% or something, I think, in the 24 hour period. And speaking to Sarah, she said, yep, yep, yep. She just kept agreeing with everything we were saying. And it made, she said that the gut full of nitrogen, the plant will respond quickly to it, but the biological, it's a slower release, more function to happen, and then we, we ended up going, the most efficient one was two and a half litres of Nutrisoil um, was our final um, nutrient application. With, with the urea? No, no, we pulled the urea because it came it, 24 hours later, the, the biologicals were still brixing higher, all the nitrogen ones had come back. Fantastic. So the way that you worked out your foliar application really was just by using a refractometer. Yep. yep. And yep. seeing what bricks ties with what you actually put on it. All right, so we can keep talking all day, Tom, but now I need to bring up Alistair, Alistair Austin, if you could take the stage. So Alistair um, and his family practice pasture cropping. Um, they have their own worm farm, compost extract machine, and leave their native grasses over summer. So um, tell us a bit about your farm. Um, yeah, well, we started out um, not knowing what we were doing. We still have no idea. <laughs> but um, it was about oh, 2013, I think, we did our first um, few biological things and it's sort of grown since then and we've learned a lot and made a lot of mistakes. Um, but now we've sort of settled on trying to retain nearly every perennial summer grass that um, comes up on the place and then just try and work the cropping around that. So it's been four years into the transition. You've had some pretty highs and lows. There's been some floods. There's been some very dry spells. Um, how can you tell if it's working? Yeah, well, um, I think the main thing for us that we're noticing now over summer, we really just, the plants that are germinating are summer perennial grasses rather than melons and wireweed and all the goodies um, so yeah the um it's really changed the uh what's what's germinating on the place and even in crop as well so we're and, and even when the weeds do germinate like last year the crop wasn't looking too bad and we're um and umming and ahhing whether we whether we should have sprayed um some cape weed out and we just decided to wait and see and in the end um yeah the Red leg earth might have got the cape weed and the wheat was fine. So, um, yeah, no, just sort of observing a bit more now rather than just going straight to the 
um, yeah, sprayer. How long did it take for that transition? So you had your nitrate uh, weeds come up initially. How many years till you started seeing the perennial grasses come in? Um, well, we, we over summer took the um, view of not spraying at all because we thought that the plants that are germinating are there to do a job and if we take them out, we're going to have to do the job for it. So um, we generally get one really, got one really bad year of say heliotrope or wireweed. Um, and then after that, they sort of would come up, like they, we let them seed and everything. They'd, uh, they'd come up, but they'd be less, uh, less in size and number. And then by the third year, you pretty much had just grasses coming out. And how do you um, prepare to go into the next crop? Do you spray it out before you go in and what do you use? Yeah, so this is something that we've um, had a fair bit of trouble with, um, with the size of our paddocks. Um, we haven't been able to get any grazing pressure um, to get the, the summer perennials down to a, um, I think Cole Sice reckons you've got to get them down to about 100 mil in height so they don't shadow your emerging crop too much. Um, so we've really struggled with that. Um, and then this year we've got, uh, bought some electric fences. So um, our grazing has improved a hell of a lot over this last, uh, eight months. Uh, so we try and graze the paddock about a month or six weeks out from sowing, pretty hard. And then as it's coming back, um, about two weeks before sowing, we'll put the sheep back in again um, and try and give that perennial a real headache. Um, so it's not going to compete too much with the crop. Um, and then just before we sow, we, um, we gramoxone it. So it just defoliates it pretty much, but it doesn't kill it. So it'll reshoot again once the crop's off at the end of the year. So why bromoxone and not glyphosate and, and how do you find working with it? Yeah, it's a pretty nasty one, um, but it doesn't kill the perennial grasses, whereas Roundup will. So you're starting from scratch every year if you use Roundup um, in summer, um, whereas yeah, the gramoxone just um, puts it into dormancy when it suits your sowing program rather than waiting for the first frost. Um, yeah, so I think we will trial things to see whether we'll um, whether we can get a good result just from grazing and giving it that double double graze, like a six week out and then um, right before sowing. Uh, we will trial that now that we've got the fences, but we haven't been able to previously, so I can't tell you how we went. Yeah. Yep. Okay. All right. We're moving along now, so I'm going to invite Brooke up to the stage. Brooke French. So Brooke has. Um, done a holistic grazing management course about two years ago. So Brooke, since your holistic grazing management course, what have you changed on your property? Uh, the biggest thing I have changed is my grazing and that still sends my mind into a spin to put everything in one mob. That was what I did first, all my sheep, all my cattle into the one mob. Um, I can't do that all through the year simply because I break my used down into smaller mobs for lambing um, and I will continue to do that. Uh, so yeah, that's been my biggest change, my mob sizes, instead of set stocking all my paddocks, um, just everything in one mob. You began your holistic management course from a discussion with someone when you were riding your horse through your saffron thistles and they were hitting your thighs. No, no, not the saffron were hitting my thighs. <laughs> the cabbage were hitting my thighs. The cabbage, right, didn't get that high. All know. right, so um, tell us how that came about and then how you've come to um, do the holistic management course and have anything happened with those thistles. Um, yeah, so I remember I was riding with a friend, she was helping me muster, and I was apologising for the amount of thistles in my paddock because obviously it makes it tricky with the dogs and um, horses, or my cover crop, I should say. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> um, so, and I remember she said to me, oh, you should talk to Dean Han. He manages his thistles with, without chemical. And, and I was like, mm -hmm. I just couldn't even comprehend that. So I was straight on the phone to Dean um, and arranged a time to go down to see Dean, which is at Gorman's place in Manda down Mandala Road. Um, I've definitely seen my variegated thistle change. I used to spray them every year on the sheep camps. They used to 
be equal to me on my horse. It was just single tracks. They were really thick. And now, well, this year they're actually non-existent. Like there's a random one here and there. And I used to spray them and they just kept coming back, coming back. Um, yeah, now they're not there. But my saffron thistle are still, they're definitely still there. I still have a lot of them. Um, but I am seeing changes what paddocks they're in like yeah the differences in the paddocks and I just have to get better at my monitoring to go back to see what I was doing in a paddock say 12 months prior as to why there's not as many this year or yeah I've just got to observe the cycle better I am seeing changes just not significant at this stage it takes time all right so tell us about the mob that you're running now so the mob I have now has 604 sheep, 225 cows, including the calves, uh, 11 horses, two goats and two alpacas. <laughs> diversity. Lots of diversity. Yes. All right. One thing that I think we can um, get confused about is the difference between rest and recovery when you're managing pastures. Did you learn about that in holistic management and can you explain that to us? Uh, yeah, we did learn about that and I see it as, and I could be wrong, someone might help me, but uh, that rest is is not, well, let's say recovery is leaving your paddocks for well, 120 to 150 days, letting the plant recover to its, I'll say original size, but that's probably not the right word, um, whereas rest is coming back too soon, getting which is what I'm probably doing at the moment, uh, coming back to my grasses too soon before they're back at their full recovered size. That's the biggest difference in rest and recovery to me. So um, with this change in management and the very dry spell in 2018, have you had to feed out? No, I didn't have to feed and I, I do believe everyone around me was feeding. I do believe that it's because well, I know it is because I had paddocks locked up at any one time, multiple paddocks that I was just getting growth, even when it's super dry and you don't think things are growing. It really is growing even, yeah, of late. I'm still getting growth. Um, yeah, definite. I have just started to feed my horses this week, but that's the first time in two years too. But in saying that, I, um, I still do have horse. I've stripped, well, electric fenced my horse paddocks um, I do still have a paddock that I haven't gone into yet, so I guess that's probably not even right to say. Mm. That's fabulous, because we've had a very dry time. Alright, so we might give these three people a round of applause.